just the properties of slab models, um, which I put in because slab models have been so widely used that I think it's important to understand the limitations. Um, one of the limitations is that they produce strong oscillations in the flow. Uh, another limitation is that they're not, they don't compare to the full non-linear model nearly as well as the linear model does. So uh, there's paper in, I had a two-part paper in the quarterly journal three years ago. Um, it was one of those papers that I thought, this is an easy paper, 10 pages, write it quickly. And then I found a few more things, so it ended up being 15 pages. And then I had a very rough time with the reviewers so it ended up being 30 pages. <laughs> and uh, it was a paper that I was, I had a bit of spare time at the end of the year and I'd done some thinking and I thought oh, I can write this paper in a month and send it off and uh, have my summer holiday. And uh, it ended up taking a whole year extra to, uh, to get the thing through. But this, as a result, it's actually a much more detailed analysis of slab models if you're interested. So that's that's uh, that's enough. So um yeah. Ekman pumping Ekman pumping in a vortex actually works in a tropical cyclone vortex. Seems to work quite well. Um, Many of the features that we see in the observations you can explain with reference to the immunized model. Uh, this I didn't show you and it's important so I'm going to have to put that into tomorrow's talk for the second variable formation. Um, now there's, as I said at the outset today, there are a stack of simplified models around and um, probably six or eight different sorts. Um, I think the ones I've shown you are the best for developing understanding. I guess the other thing that's worth saying is um, there was a paper in the quarterly journal a few years ago where someone had a Bake Off, um, a, a competition between simple models of the proper cyclone boundary layer and they were comparing them to observations. So the um, the person doing the paper had uh, the linear model, they had a couple of versions of the slab model and they had a model that's been used a lot by linear engineers and they had basically a contest to see which one was matched the observations better and the linear model won, which made me very happy with the <laughs> So, you know, I think that also justifies my decision to, to show you the linear model. Anyway, sorry to have gone a little bit over time. And thank you for your attention. So it's time for lunch, but do you have any questions or comments? Sure, please. Can I ask you a question about the slide in section two before the break? I'm interested in the wave number one structure. Could you move on to the slide of the horizontal flow relative to the storm motion? Oh, was this? Was this in the second part? This yeah. one? Yeah. So you explained that the uh, wave number one structure is determined by the uh, interaction between the uh, radial flow and tangential flow. So I'm also interested in the what determines the location of the updraft. Uh, but from motion, but updraft occurs uh, in the uh, to, to the front of the storm. Mm -hmm. So what maybe given the
conservation of mass, uh, the updraft of curves in the inflow, and that's the inflow region. Yes. So we have the strongest. Um, we have the strongest inflow towards the front of the storm, and that basically gives us an inflow asymmetry, which is biased towards the front. Uh, I, I, I guess one of the things that's important to say here is that this is the frictional updraft asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you observe it in cyclones, and you know, if you look at the radar imagery, there's often a tendency for maximum reflectivity to be towards the front of the storm. But it can also occur, it can also be quite variable and sometimes the strongest reflectivity is towards the rear of the storm. Uh, there have been a couple of studies which have looked at the um, reflectivity asymmetry with respect to environmental wind shear and with respect to motion. I think um, Kristen Corbosiero and John Molinari did one and another one of them. John Molinari and another one of his students have also looked at it. And, and what seems to be happening here is that the rainfall asymmetry can also be produced by environmental wind shear. And you know, when we have environmental wind shear, it tilts the storm over. And as, because the storm is tilted, you get an adjustment in the circular motion because the tilt implies some asymmetry in the pressure gradient, which has to be sustained balanced by areas of ascent and descent. That effect seems to be stronger than the boundary line friction asymmetry. So in the studies which have looked at large numbers of storms, they've tended to find that the environmental wind shear is a better predictor of convective asymmetry than the storm motion. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there are some um, there are some cases where storm motion comes out to have an effect. One of the, it, it seems to work um, in a storm like George with the profiles I showed you, the George was comparatively fast moving and so the, um, the friction induced asymmetry was quite strong and perhaps that helped have a reasonable natural observations. Um, Mitch, in contrast, was a very slow moving kind of storm. So the friction Wait. As for this figure, uh, there is a, uh, the convergence of the radial flow occurs in the front of that cyclone. And we can also expect the convergence of the tangential direction to the rear of the cyclone because the uh, Tangential flow uh, is larger. Yes. Yeah, so, you, so there's a there's a com component of convergence due to the tangential flow here, which uh, shows up. That's sort of the tail of the updraft there. But as you go further around, you start getting the um, asymmetric outflow in this region. So you've got an asymmetric convergence component, which is going to tend to, which uh, tends to weaken the updraft towards the rear of the storm. So that, that means the uh, convergence of the radial flow is more dominant. Yes, the convergence of the radial flow is dominant, and that's partly because the radial frictional flow is actually a little bit stronger than the azimuth of the flow because we've got that um, 2v on r plus f divided by f plus the vorticity uh, factor between the radial and the um, azimuth of the flow, frictional flow. Thank you. One just question. So you in your linear model, you assume that the K is constant everywhere. Yes. Um, so this means that you give uh, mixing length. The mixing length is a constant everywhere. 
Ah, no. Actually, K is constant, so... Okay, and the viscosity is constant. Yes. Uh, so the mixing, you can make K vary with radius. That's, that's uh, valid within the model, but it's constant with height. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that is valid because um, in some sense you can adjust this K so that you will get the very nice result, right? So how how, uh, how do you how do you give K? I've in the cases I show, I've always used K equals fifty. Um, the paper that did the comparison actually did some tuning of the model and they discovered that K equals 70 meters square per second was the best value. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a couple, K is a very difficult thing to measure from observations, but there have been a, one of uh, Jun Zhang's papers made some estimates of K in a quite intense hurricane, and they were around about 100. I think that they, they, there was a fair bit of scatter, and I think he's, they, they were, was centered on about 100, but I think that varied from 50 to 200 or something like that. Um, there's, yes, yeah, so, and, and if you look at, I haven't shown you any plots of it, but if you take the turbulence parameterization in the nonlinear model and work out at a vertical mean K near the eye wall, that's often around about 50. So I think 50 is a Good value to use. But of course, it depends on the intensity of the hurricane, right? It does. So that's a typical, typical value. Yes. So for a more intense hurricane, you'd expect uh, K to be larger. Yeah, and anyway, I'm happy to see that this very simple linear model predicts the <laughs> observation data. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Yes, it's always nice when uh, when simple dynamics can explain complicated things, and I think this is. This is one of the, to me, this is one of the appealing pieces about this, um, this bit of science. When you can uh, have quite complicated variability, but uh, actually seems to have a fairly simple explanation. Simple explanations are always nice. Okay. All right. So let's have a lunch, and the next session we will start at uh, one p.m. <laughs> around one p.m. Please <laughs> <laughs> enjoy your lunch. The lunch will be at the uh, restaurant. Oh, beautiful. Ah, oh, beautiful. All right. Did you after. Before. Having a lunch, uh, let's take the photo. Because uh, tomorrow will be raining, so please follow our organized committee. Please, we take you to be a good place to go. <laughs>